I don't think you've ever walked down one. Yeah. Well, well, I'm pretty sure no, I know I have never walked up. Yeah. I think the, yeah, the, the best yeah. one is, is rising okay. games. Hey, hello. Right <laughs> First, I want to thank the, uh, we picked up three new members uh, tonight. Is someone sitting there? So no. These are still just, I think we're at like 230 now. So, it's, yeah, they're really coming along really well. Is it on? Yes. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'd like to welcome all the new members and the guests and the Zoom format people and their members and guests. Thank you. This is our July program. Okay, this is being recorded, so I get to say that. And uh, it's going to be uploaded on the squirrelhillhistory.org website. And uh, all these, there's like 200 programs on the website, so you can go in there and, and spend them. Few weeks, if you wish, look at it every day. And there's the new formats in there. Just have to follow through. So we're working on a whole new way of making it easier to, to uh, find everything. There's so many programs and topics. And uh, tonight, me. what's your name? Oh, I'm right <laughs> <in> there. <laughs> I'm Jim Hammond, the uh, president of uh, Screw Hill. Uh, Helen Wilson here is our VP news editor, researcher, and we have Tony, he's our um, email coordinator, another researcher, and also is the president of the uh, Neil Log House. And there's, uh, we got Todd, Todd Miller, he's our program chairman, uh, Toby, um, Stanley Klein, the membership chairman, I don't see him, Evelyn Young, our treasurer, uh, Audrey Glitman, back here on our camera. She's been a busy lady, lady down to trial and all. Uh, Wayne Bostinger, another researcher, he is not here tonight. Uh, Charles, you here tonight? He's right. I always miss you for some reason. You're too young. <laughs> <laughs> another one of our researchers. Connie Wilson, he's back at the back table. And uh, Jean Benstock is not here tonight. She's uh, she'll eventually get back here. She's not doing well right now. Okay, on uh, upcoming things around Pittsburgh or Squirrel Hill, August 8th, uh, there is going to be a board meeting at 7:30 uh, here. Uh, at the, uh, yeah, yeah, August 8th. That's the next Tuesday. We don't generally have a meeting in August. So we're going to have a board meeting and then have a social afterwards. And there'll be more information coming out of that. So everybody's welcome. And it's a kind of a meet and greet and find out who everybody is and, and tell us what you think and new projects and things we should be doing. Uh, there's also coming up, uh, people probably know about this Irish Center Zoning Board meeting and all the information has been going around on that. That is now moved to, uh, let's see, August 3rd at 9.30, and it's going to be on Zoom. And if I remember right, you go to PittsburghPA.gov. Did I get to that? Just um, Google Pittsburgh Board Adjustment. Pittsburgh Board of Adjustment. And that takes you to the machine. Okay. But there's been a lot of uh, information out on that. And, uh, oh, 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 now I see what and Squirrel Hill Historical Society has put a lot of information out. We're not saying one way or the other. We're just trying to give the history of what's going on down there. So, and you can uh, take that as you may. Where is the meeting? It's a Zoom meeting. It's a Zoom meeting Zoom only. Meeting. Oh, only. Uh, yeah, ZBA, I think they call that, what, Zoning Board of Adjustment. Yeah, I think I, I Google it under... Um, under the, uh, I think I really did under the Pittsburgh zoning meeting and it popped up. But there's a lot of other websites and uh, you can send anything else out, Helen, lately? Um, we have in our, um, in the, the, the July newsletter, we do have the um, web address in it. If okay. You have the newsletter. Yeah, July newsletter. And if you're not a member, you can get a member and get that newsletter. <laughs> and like I said, we have three new ones tonight. Thank you again. Uh, another coming up Squirrel Hill Market. The second one is coming up August 26th. 
I wasn't here for the first one, so I don't know how it went. Probably didn't <coughs> rain, I hope. Here they go. Down. It's their fun to go to. But anyway, and they have a lot of make it booths and uh, all kinds of things going on. A lot of food. All right. Uh, next big thing, something I really like to do, the Vintage Grand Prix. Yeah, that's coming, and that's going to, the big race is the 22nd and 23rd of July. But there's a lot of other stuff, like down at the waterfront, they'll have cars, and down on Walnut Street. You have to go to their website, and they'll tell you there's a, like two weeks worth of different races, and car showings, and someone's going to have a Tucker. Automobile apparently must have got it out of a museum someplace. Oh boy! Um, but yeah, it's kind of cool to walk around and see all that. Uh, anybody's been to the Woods House? They are going to have a summer music series. Uh, I haven't been to this one, but on July 13th, that's pretty quick. And you, you can they're going to have local artists and music. And you can go on their website and and um, you probably will have to get a. I think they have to get a reservation, I imagine. They don't, they don't have that much seating there. But that uh, that's a nice place if you haven't been there. And you can look out and see the mill on the other side and all the, all the um, uh, solar panels on that roof over there. I think that's the largest solar panel on roofs anywhere in the United States. It's huge. Okay. Uh, oh, the other good news. Uh, if you haven't been over the new Fern Hollow Bridge, it is open, and it's kind of cool. I have not walked it yet, but on the one side, they have uh, the history of the rivers underneath the bridge. Uh, it's like, I don't know, 27 million years ago and all this. It's pretty cool. And the trail underneath, there's some artists I know, my, my daughter knows, that put some, uh, they made rocks. and all kinds of cool things underneath the bridge too. So that's, uh, I've been over that about five times now, just for the fun of it. And it, it will not collapse. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's pretty much I have on that. We're gonna have, uh, Helen's gonna say a few words, and then uh, Tony is gonna say a few things about the uh, log house, and then Todd, We'll introduce our speaker and give our updates, and then uh, after the answer, answer and questions and all that uh, period, uh, we'll then go to adjournment and uh, we'll have help folding up chairs and we put them back, back, put them back away. Okay, that's all I have. Is this on? Um, I'm going to be very brief, but just an announcement that we have put 60 pictures so far on Historic Pittsburgh. If you've gone to that website, that's Pitts, the University of Pittsburgh's um, premier website for everything about Pittsburgh history. Photographs, um, documents, texts, photo um, I said photographs, maps. So anyway, you can now go to historicpittsburgh.org and see the Squirrel Hill Historical Society collection. And if you have any pictures, please let us scan them and add them to the collection. That's all. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jim asked me to say a few words uh, updating the product on Tony and Davina uh, on the board here, but I'm also president of the Friends of Neil Log House. And what you're looking at is historic progress toward uh, the upcoming reconstruction of the new log house that will begin on or about August 24th. Uh, this is very, very big news for us. Uh, our board uh, was formed in October of 21, and we're short of two years. We actually were able to enter into the cooperation agreement with the city and enter into the contract with our selected contractor, Village Restorations of Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, yeah, Laura, thank you for flipping through. What you're seeing is the very first phase, uh, pre-construction phase, delivery of logs to the site, which was quite an undertaking. We had to coordinate this with the city and with First Tee, which is the leaseholder, the golf course that surrounds the Neil Log House. 
these are individuals, uh, the owner and uh, some restoration specialists from Village Restorations delivering the first of a batch of eight white oak logs that will be used after they shore up the house. Uh, the article in the newsletter gives the full scope of work uh, that's going to take place this summer and it's going to occur over many weeks. But what's going to happen first is kind of a fun thing, kind of a precursor to the construction. Uh, the, one of the gentlemen you, you saw on the previous screen, uh, they had their gas and they were unloading these 800 pound logs on site. And the one is uncut. Uh, there's actually going to be a demonstration log hewing on August 5th. Uh, watch for more information. It'll be in our newsletter. It'll be on the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition website. Uh, it's going to be from 2 to 4 in the afternoon. Uh, Helen was the one who came up with this. Uh, loggers for loggers. Uh, <laughs> in, independent brew company is, is providing uh, complimentary beer. There will be lemonade too. Uh, hopefully ice cream. But uh, it's going to be a fun event. It's by registration only. And the last thing I want to say is we are in need of a handful of volunteers. So if you'd like to come and have, you know, if you're planning to come anyhow and you'd like to help, we could give you, we're not going to have you handle the logs, okay? It, it'll be very friendly. But if you want to see me after the meeting, it would be appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, I'm Todd Miller, the Program and Co-Coordinator uh, for the Historical Society, and uh, our program this evening is a history of the steps of Pittsburgh. And I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Laura Zarowski. She's a Pittsburgh-based writer and photographer and technical writer at the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy, and uh, has studied the public steps of Pittsburgh extensively and will discuss her findings. Her forthcoming book on the subject will be published by the University of Pittsburgh Press, and uh, it builds upon the content of Bob Regan's 2004 book, Pittsburgh Steps, the story of uh, the city's public stairways. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Laura Zarowski. Laura, welcome. To, uh, to give this talk. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, I, uh, I have been writing and writing about and photographing the city stairs since 2017. Um, and during that time, I have managed to, in uh, succeeding to visit all uh, 900 flights around the city. Wow. <laughs> and I'm taking photos of them, uh, working on a book that hopefully will be published uh, next year sometime. And, uh, but what we're going to talk about uh, tonight is, is this is really, because this is the Historical Society, it's really about the, the history of this very unique form of municipal infrastructure that, that Pittsburgh has. Um, and uh, so let's see if this clicker will work. Here we go. Yes, excellent. Okay, so let's start off. This is like uh, this is this is the like the super ancient uh, history here. So the reason why we have so many city steps here in Pittsburgh is our very unruly landscape. And this particular map that you see here uh, shows the topography. Now, for all of you who live here in Squirrel Hill. For the most part, uh, you're all pretty lucky because this is one of the flatter neighborhoods <laughs> in the city. Uh, but as you look at this, uh, this kind of like this heat map here, all of the areas that are red uh, show the wildest change in elevation. And in some places here in Pittsburgh, that change in elevation uh, is 660 feet. It goes up. It goes up to that. <laughs> Those neighborhoods that have that very uh, unruly, wild uh, landscape tend to be uh, in the south side in the South Hills, as you can kind of see all of that there on the map. Uh, there's a fair amount of the north side that, that has that as well, at Troy Hill, uh, the Perry North and South, uh, Spring Hill, Fine View. And then when we look to the east end, uh, you know, you do see some red there. Uh, it definitely tends to be in the Hazelwood area as well as uh, like the Hill District and Polish Hill. Um, you also see some uh, up in the, the northern area of say like uh, Homewood North 
and uh, you know Stanton Heights, Morningside, and a little bit of East Hills in there as well. But um, this topography is really the reason why Pittsburgh had to start building all of these city steps uh, because it just made you know traveling uh, at a time when you know people didn't have cars and things like that. It really made uh, it was a necessity. Okay, next. Okay, so if you keep that last map in mind, when you look at this one here, uh, this map is, uh, it shows all of the, the nine neighborhoods that are here throughout the four quadrants, and the different red dots that are there uh, indicate where the city steps are located. Uh, and for the most part, the stairs are spread out pretty evenly throughout all 90 neighborhoods. There are a couple that don't have any city stairs. Uh, those tend to be, of course, the flattest of the neighborhoods. So, you know, we see their downtown, the Strip District. Um, there's some of the outlying areas out in the West End, uh, an area uh, known as Fairywood, uh, which is uh, now primarily uh, an, an Amazon distribution center <laughs> that's out there. Uh, but uh, that's a primarily an industrial area, but that's another neighborhood that doesn't have any city steps. Um, but pretty much everywhere else you go, and look, you're going to see at least at least one or two. Um, and, uh, and so this just kind of gives you an idea of, of where they are. And it's important to note, particularly with this map, is that this represents the stairs that were constructed in the post-World War II era. Um, we're going to talk about that in greater detail as I go through the presentation. Um, but this is when the city really had its first concerted infrastructure build out uh, was in the, the five years immediately following the end of the war. And it certainly uh, must have been a very exciting time to be alive and to be living here. All right. Next. All right, here we go. Okay, so in terms of, of building the stairs and building infrastructure, uh, we're going to start like at City Steps 1.0 here. Um, and we have two different ways of finding out and locating where the oldest of the city steps were located. Now the thing that you need to remember with this is that for the most part all of these stairs that we're talking about uh, that were constructed in the 1800s do not exist anymore. Um, and however, it's important to know where they were located because uh, you know it gives us a, an insight as to you know what the history of uh, uh, the build-out history of the city looked like, and also in some cases, while those old 1800s era city steps don't exist anymore, uh, newer ones have been built in their place, and I'm going to talk about that in a in a few slides. So this particular slide up here, one of the ways that we find find out about where the stairs were located are the Sanborn fire insurance maps. Now this is something that was an absolute necessity for cities uh, in, the, in the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century because um, during that time fire was one of the, the greatest fears of anyone living in an urban environment. And, as we probably know from Pittsburgh's history, Pittsburgh had sustained some uh, several very devastating fires uh, throughout the 17 and the 1800s. So having these fire insurance maps gave everyone an idea of where the buildings were, what they were made out of, and then streets and access points around them. Um, the oldest surviving printed map that shows where the city steps were located dates to 1884. That image that's on the slide is not the 1884 map, uh, but for Sanborn, that is, the, um, that is the, the oldest surviving record that we know of so far. Um, and before I continue on to the next slide, I just want to use, uh, I'd like to just read out this quote by uh, uh, journalist and war correspondent Ernie Pyle, who um, had a very, somewhat legendary uh, story that was printed about his travels and visits to Pittsburgh um, in the late 1930s. And this is just a, a segment from the article, but it talks about, uh, he says, the well-to-do people drive to work. The medium people go on streetcars and inclines, and the poor people walk the steps. 
And that was a super relevant insight, um, both back in 1937, it was also super relevant for when the stairs started to be built in the 1880s, and it's still very relevant today. Um, because even though in 1937, there were many other forms of transportation, right? It's like by that time, people had, you know, private automobiles, and there were street cars, um, you know, there were, there were numerous ways to get around. But the city steps did not cost any money. And for people who were either the newest immigrants who were here, or people who were unskilled laborers, um, you know, riding a streetcar or taking an incline was costing some serious money. And it's not to say that like the very working class people never took public transportation, uh, but it would have been something that they maybe would have saved for a more special occasion. Um, it's not something that they really would have had um, the ability to do every single day traveling to and from work. So the other source uh, that is really fantastic for learning about the history of the city steps is the uh, City of Pittsburgh archives. And uh, for my project here, I have to give a shout out to Charles, who's uh, sitting over here, the young guy who's actually quite tall. Um, <laughs> uh, Ch Charles is really super helpful and instrumental um, in helping me to do research on the history of the city steps uh, beyond the Sanborn fire insurance maps. And so Charles, uh, through accessing uh, and being so familiar with the city archives, was able to, um, you know, locate, this is never like seen before information, because as you probably know about the city archives, you know, does boxes, hundreds of boxes of municipal records, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands, right, of municipal records um, were kept in storage for, for decades, um, over a century. And this was information that people had never been able to see until the last five or six years with the advent of the City of Pittsburgh archives where archivists uh, and, and, uh, and librarians such as Charles and, and the team that he works with for the city were able to start going through all of that accumulated um, municipal records, everything from uh, ordinances, uh, fo old photographs, uh, letters that residents would send to city government and to their council people and their ward bosses. All of that information uh, really for such a long time has just been sitting in boxes and now um, it is being digitized so that people like myself can go in and access and you know get uh, a, a greater insight into what was happening at the city government level um, during these different important times in history. So based on uh, research that Charles was able to do through the archives, we've determined at this point that the oldest surviving record that talks about when the city steps were constructed um, dates from 1870. So that predates the earliest Sanborn fire insurance map that we knew of just a few years earlier. Um, and that first flight of city steps that was constructed in 1870 was in uptown Soho area, uh, where Duquesne University is located now. Um, it was an area that was then called Boyd's Hill. And it totally makes sense that that was one of the, if that was the first location uh, for building a public stairway, simply because of the number of people that resided in that area. Um, and that is such a, a high, steep cliff um, to get down to the river. And with so much industry lining the river, it was really an essential um, transportation need to bring all of those workers that lived in the uptown area down to the industry that lined the river. So, of course, uh, once the city starts building these and says, okay, well, we're going to build that one on, in Boyd's Hill, let's do that, then, of course, you know, someone else is going to want to fly the stairs, and so on and so on. And so it's not surprising that we then start to see from 1873 on that construction by the city 
uh, of City Steps begins in earnest. And the next location the city started building stairs in was over in the south side slopes. And this is pretty interesting because in 1872, that was when the, um, the south side slopes was a separate municipality at that time, but had uh, kind of joined forces and decided to annex itself and become a part of Pittsburgh. So while we don't, at least now, have any documentation that talks about like, well, what was the deal between the South Side coming to join Pittsburgh and like, what did Pittsburgh say it was going to provide as you know, part of all that legal wrangling. Uh, but I find it very interesting that in, in 1873, uh, the city of Pittsburgh started constructing stairs in the South Side slopes. Um, and in those areas, uh, some, of the, some of the stairs, they still exist today. Josephine Street is one of them. Um, you may be familiar, this is a very beautiful uh, stairway in the South Side Slopes that has a, a, a mosaic mural that has been installed on it. Um, and that is a flight of stairs that while the, the flight that you can walk up and down on at Josephine Street is not the original flight from 1873, it's in the same location. Um, and so yes, so starting, so starting in 18, uh, 1873, construction began in earnest and would continue as such uh, for many decades to come. So I like to call these, what was being built in the late 1800s, early 1900s, I call this City Steps 1.0. Um, you know, for those of you that remember like the dial-up modems for the internet, you know, we call it Internet 1.0. This is kind of like the dial-up modem version of City Stairs. Uh, they were made out of wood for the most part. Uh, as we crest into the, the 20th century, uh, the City Stairs uh, made out of stone slab uh, would start to come into play. But in the 1800s, uh, things were made out of wood. And this is a flight here that no longer exists. Um, however, it uh, traverses an area that you're probably very familiar with today. Uh, this connects West Carson Street up to Mount Washington, Duquesne Heights. So if you were to go up to the very top there, that's Grandview Avenue. Um, and uh, close to like where the overlook is and, and all of that. This was called the Indian Trail Steps. Um, it had over a thousand individual steps and it was a little over a mile long. Uh, you can only imagine uh, what it was like to particularly walk up that flight after uh, a long 12-hour shift, you know, at the mill down below. However, I often think, well, we look at that and say, oh boy, that looks pretty awful. You know, for the workers that lived up in Mount Washington that, that worked along the river at West Carson Street, before those stairs were built, they were still going up and down that hillside. They were just traversing a footpath that uh, actually dated uh, back to the earliest settles here. It was a, a footpath that was used by the, the Native Americans that had lived here for centuries, uh, you know, before Westerners arrived. Uh, but that footpath to, to get up uh, in Crest Mount Washington uh, is something that had been used by people for a long time. And I just, I like to think about and reflect on how frightening at times and difficult walking up and down that footpath must have been for people. But that was really the only way for people to be able to get to work. Um, and so, you know, they did what they had to do. And, no trees. Yeah. Completely treeless. Yeah, by here, this, uh, this is a photo from uh, 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 probably 1911 here. But yes, by, by that time, uh, most of the working class areas of Pittsburgh have been completely deforested. So, okay, so we build, you know, we're building all these wooden stairs. People are happy because now they're not walking, uh, you know, these dirt paths. They have a little bit more stability. It's a little, it's a little safer. Um, but as you all know, wood doesn't last forever, right? If you've got a, a front porch or a deck or something like that, it's only a matter of time uh, before the wood starts to decay. Uh, you know, things can happen to it. And of course, 
this is in a time uh, before we had things like pressure treated lumber. Um, so what had started to happen over time, and this became, uh, uh, this problem was exceptionally exacerbated as we got into the Great Depression, the wooden stairs were really in bad shape. Um, the city had very little funds uh, for repairing them. Uh, the city did re receive federal funding and WPA funding, which helped. Uh, however, this is a time when more and more people are coming to Pittsburgh. Uh, this was also a time that because there was so much hardship and very few um, social safety nets in place, people were prone to taking the stairs apart so that they could burn them for firewood. Uh, this was something that was happened often. You know, Pittsburgh winters used to be a lot colder than they are now. Um, and this was something that, you know, people would do to, to stay alive. Um, and then, of course, you know, from the Depression, we enter World War II. And during World War II, everything comes to a total standstill in terms of the city being able to spend money uh, for repairing infrastructure. Um, and there's also a, a shortage of men here in terms of building and, and fixing, uh, fixing infrastructure, particularly the stairs. Uh, and so for many years, people, uh, you know, were just trying to get around in these awful conditions. And so in 1945, this is like a, a real interesting bit of history, um, you know, as, as we know from history, this mayoral race that was to take place the following year resulted in David Lawrence becoming mayor of Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, which is, I think most people would say, you know, a very good thing for the city uh, at that time. However, uh, the story shows that he actually had, uh, he had a pretty serious challenger um, uh, by a Republican by the name of Robert Waydell, who was a football coach at what is now CMU. And, uh, and, and uh, Waddell here was, uh, he was definitely going after the working class popular vote. And he spent a lot of time and got an awful lot of press traveling through neighborhoods that had city steps that were in really bad shape. And, you know, me as the politicians, meeting with people, commiserating, and getting lots of photo ops uh, like what is shown here. And, uh, you know, it does show that, you know, with, with Waddell, of course, you know, Lawrence won, clear, clear out. There was absolutely no doubt about that. But Waddell ran a really strong race and had a very strong contingent of, of supporters. And uh, so that's just a, a little bit that it's like people often remember the victors, but they don't often remember the, the person who was not the victor. And, uh, and that, that there is Robert Waddell, who, uh, who really did care about the city steps and used them as part of his, his platform, to, uh, uh, in, as part of his mayoral bid. So as the war comes to the end, and then we start moving into the five years following, um, the city, you know, was kind of, what, with infrastructure, it was really at this, like, boiling over point. Um, and it wasn't just the stairs, like, everything was falling apart. Um, and so the city, uh, for 1946, going into 1946-1947, the city had secured funding to repair uh, close to 20 flights of stairs, and then bonds were issued to fund almost another 800 flights that would be repaired over the next five years. And this at the time was an absolutely unheard of uh, spend. And this was really Pittsburgh's great uh, municipal infrastructure investment that took place then. And it was that combination of having, you know, having the war come to the end, needing to have jobs uh, for the returning servicemen and women, uh, but then also, you know, the, pacifying and, and doing something to help all of the people that were here uh, who had been really languishing under, under the poor conditions. And for the next several years, 
the work on the city steps was something that made front page news. Now you have to remember, you know, in these years, it's like, oh, it was before social media and TV and, you know, all of that. And newspaper stories are full of photographs like these here that were talking about the conditions of the stairs. And then as each new flight, this is a flight here in the south side slopes, uh, St. Thomas, St. Thomas Street, which is still in existence and, and still looks pretty similar to that photo there. Um, this was something that people were very, very excited about. It was an extremely popular project that uh, garnered an awful lot of, of goodwill and support all over the city. So, okay, so we have the City Steps 1.0, which is, you know, the 1800s, early 1900s, everything's made out of wood. And then we have City Steps 2.0 which is that post-World War II boom. Things are being made out of concrete and steel. Uh, you know, people are excited. It's great, glory times, everyone's so excited. And then, as we know, the city invested all that money. It, the city built infrastructure for 700,000 people, because in the 1950 census, there were 700,000 people that, li that lived within city of Pittsburgh limits. But then we know that once we start to move beyond the 50s into the 60s, 70s, everything was to start to change. Uh, economic and industry would change here in Pittsburgh. You'd have the advent of suburbs and personal automobiles and people would be leaving the city um, until, uh, in the, I would say, the last two decades uh, when our population has settled at about 300,000 people. So that's an important thing to remember. We built infrastructure in the late 40s, early 50s for 700,000 people. That infrastructure, for the most part, is still with us today, even though we are 300,000. So in the 1990s, 25 years, almost 30 years ago at this point, um, Bob Regan, who I'm sure some of you here are very familiar uh, with Bob and, and with his book. Uh, he lives here in Squirrel Hill. Um, Bob Regan uh, moved to Pittsburgh from Boston, Massachusetts to take an engineering uh, a faculty position at the engineering school at Pitt. And uh, Bob, at the time, was working on uh, the early precursor to, to uh, uh, geographical information systems, mapping, right? Like, how do we take data and information about municipalities and use the power of the computer, uh, you know, to, to put all of this onto maps, right? Um, you know, in the late 90s, this was still pretty, like, cutting-edge new technology. You know, today, we have smartphones, and we can just, you know, ask Siri to, you know, give us driving directions or all of that, but this was all very new when, when Bob was doing it. And when he came to Pittsburgh, he was immediately taken by the city steps because he thought this it, you know, this is really an interesting mapping problem. So I would like to get a list of all where all these city steps are located because we're going to do some mapping with all of this. And of course, you know, Bob was making some phone calls around the city and public works and people at that time in the late 90s just said, you know, sorry, but we can't help you. Like, we just don't have that information. Like, yeah, we have a little bit of information. Public Works can help you with some things, but you're probably better off going to the library or going to the Heinz History Center and looking at those Sanborn fire insurance maps. Um, and so Bob, because, you know, he's a researcher and an engineer and always loves a good challenge, uh, and also because he's an avid cyclist and he thought, hey, this is going to be a great way for me to bike around Pittsburgh and get to know my new, my new city. Um, got on his bike and spent the next several years pretty much biking on every street throughout the 90 neighborhoods um, looking for the stairs. And through his research, uh, he collected all of his data, um, as engineers are so adept at, and, uh, and he wrote a book. The, the first book, which is not shown on this screen, went out of print, unfortunately, because the local publisher went out of business. But a few years later, the manuscript was picked up, and this book was, this book was published by Globe Pequot, a national publisher, and, uh, and was released in 2016. <coughs> um, and all of this leads to, now, me moving to Pittsburgh, and from Providence, Rhode Island, a very flat place by the ocean. 
no stairs. Uh, and I came here, and I live in the neighborhood uh, at Upper Hill, near Polish Hill. And I have a bunch of city steps in my neighborhood, and I thought, hmm, this is really interesting. Like, what's all of this about? I've never seen these things before. And, uh, you know, as I was traveling around, I'd see more. And then one day, I happened to go into a bookstore, and in the Pittsburgh section, because I was looking to learn more about Pittsburgh as I was living here, I came across this book. And I thought, ooh, let's see what this is all about. And, uh, and I decided, and I realized in looking through it and doing a little research of like, oh, okay, this is a book that's out now, but this is actually a book that came out in the late 1990s. So almost 20 years have passed. I'm really interested in seeing what 20 years has brought to Pittsburgh. So I took, I took Bob's book, and then I, I met Bob. Bob and I have become friends over the years. Uh, and I started recreating his journey. So Bob shared with me all of his data. As I said, engineers, they collect a lot of data. Um, he shared his data with me, and then I just essentially started following. I started where Bob started, and then I went from one flight of stairs to the next. And I photographed those flights, and I wrote about them. And through traveling through those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of flights of stairs, um, I had the best immersion in Pittsburgh's history that one could ever imagine. Oh, let's see. Can we get to the next slide? Oh, no. Oh, yeah, the light's on. Can you advance my slide for me? I can just, I, you can do my human clicker. <laughs> you can, oh, the mouse is clicked up, yeah. slide is, is right up at the top corner. If you just click on that, it'll... Okay. You know, I'm just going to take, I'm going to put this down for just a quick second and come over to my computer. Be cool. <laughs> I might have to just yeah, if you just uh, yeah, you know if you if you just stay stay close that would be just in case it doesn't work again. Let me take this. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it was just taking a little break. <laughs> so some of the things that I've learned by my own travels and also through talking with Bob and doing research and everything. Pittsburgh actually has 344 legal streets that are flights of stairs. Now, up until a couple years ago, if you were using uh, like Siri, Google Maps, Waze, any of that, you could still be given directions in your car. Take a left on to Homer Street. <laughs> that's, that's that right there. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> Car's not going up that. <laughs> uh, Fortunately, in the last few years, they, you know, thankfully, because Google is here and the Google Street View car is out uh, all the time, that does not happen anymore, uh, which is really wonderful, uh, because that just makes things uh, so much so much easier when when you're driving. I also want to point out the flight that's over there on the left hand side. That is um, Fraser and Romeo Street. That's in Oakland, mm -hmm. off of Bates. Um, and this is a flight that is currently, and this is a very interesting flight because it's perpendicular. It's two flights of stairs that, that meet on a shared catwalk. Um, and there are a couple of flights throughout Pittsburgh that were originally constructed this way. And if you're someone that likes to see interesting construction of infrastructure, um, I highly recommend you go and take a look. Just go down there and like walk around and see it because this whole intersection here is scheduled for complete redevelopment and will most likely be removed. And, re and there's still going to be city steps in there, but it's going to be completely different from the way it is right now because this area is at the intersection um, of where the big uh, Hazelwood uh,
business incubator corridor is uh, connecting uh, Oakland uh, along the river, Oakland to Hazelwood, and it's an area that gets an awful lot of traffic and people and whatever. So this whole area right here is is being um, is being redone. So I always like to say to people like, "Ooh, this is an old historic one. If you, if you like seeing old historic things, uh, head on over there and, and check it out because." Within a year or two, it's going to be very different. Let's see. Oh, good. All right. Maybe it was just on a break. <laughs> but it's working now. Okay, so uh, sidewalk steps and wooden stairways. So in addition to having those uh, kind of like free, uh, freestanding, built into the hillside, cantilevered, crazy long flights of stairs, the city also has hundreds, almost 300, sidewalk stairs that are scattered throughout the city. Um, this here, I believe, is uh, Virginia Avenue in Mount Washington. Uh, Mount Washington is an exceptionally hilly neighborhood from block to block. It's like a roller coaster going through that neighborhood. And, uh, and sidewalk stairs like that one there just provide a, a safer way for, for people to, to walk and travel along. Um, wood, while that was the building material available to people in the 1800s, uh, for the most part, wood is not what we make the stairs out of today. However, uh, in neighborhoods where the city stairs are needed because there are a few houses um, and there are people that need to have access to a main road, wood is still a popular choice because it's, you know, it's something that is relatively quick and easy to build or repair um, and it's inexpensive building material and there's still approximately 90 to 100 uh, wooden flights that, that exist out there in various locations however just like in the days of old the wooden stairs are really t especially today susceptible to the Amazon delivery truck <laughs> Because often it's like, you know, these are narrow little streets and the delivery truck comes through and then they're trying to turn around and, you know, if they can't see things, it's so easy to, you know, back into a, a flight of wooden stairs that come right out onto the street. And so oftentimes with the wooden stairs, you can see either the top of the bottom, whichever area gets more vehicle traffic is often like, you know, a little off kilter and looks like it's been, it's been battered around a little bit. So the city of Pittsburgh really does have miles and miles of stairs, and the South Side Slopes uh, wins that competition for miles and miles, hands down. Uh, the neighborhood has 68 flights with over 5,400 individual steps. Uh, of course, if you've been over into the slopes, you know it's super hilly, and you know based on the facts of the history of the neighborhood, we had all of that industry that lined the river along the south side flats. And then we had all of the people that were living up along the slopes and up into Arlington and up into Allentown. And uh, having those stairs to get people who, who lived on those little narrow streets to get them down to the river was super essential. Um, the South Side Slopes is a neighborhood that, much like other parts of Pittsburgh, it has seen some depopulation for sure. Uh, however, the neighborhood transitioned from being one that was primarily mill workers and their families to now being very popular with college students and young professionals. Uh, you know, East Carson Street is uh, kind of like an entertainment zone for, for a lot of people. And uh, so for that reason, uh, it has maintained a certain amount of, of popularity that's there. And for the last 20, I want to say 22, it might even be 23 years, the Southside Slopes Neighborhood Association has hosted its annual Step Trek. Uh, they, it's a, a fundraiser for the neighborhood and the business association. And literally thousands of people come, not just from Pittsburgh, but from all over, uh, to come and you can get a black map and you can get a gold map and you can go and walk all over the neighborhood and there's, uh, you know, up and down the stairs and there's often a lot of like, you know, music and crafts and food trucks and, you know, all kinds of stuff for people to do. And um, there's a photo of me down at the bottom. I've just climbed the top of Yard Way, which is one of the longest flights in Pittsburgh. And then they have like a little bell that you can ring at the top. <laughs> Once you've caught your breath. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs>
Another thing uh, that the South Side Slopes has, um, still some great examples of um, our orphan houses. And that's different from an orphanage. This doesn't have anything to do with children who do not have parents. Um, an orphan house is a house that does not have street access. Um, it is only, historically, was only connected by a flight of city steps. Now, when these houses were being built in like the early part of the 20th century, not having, car, uh, not having street access was not a big deal because working class people in these neighborhoods didn't have cars. Uh, and in fact, being on a flight of stairs might actually be uh, a positive because chances are you were going up and down those stairs to get to work. Uh, however, as time went by and Pittsburgh changed and population changed and you know people now have cars and, and all of that, houses that don't have easy street access are at a real disadvantage. Um, and as Pittsburgh has lost people, many of the orphan houses just became abandoned and in time were demolished. This is something that because the South Side Slopes has maintained that population, there are still plenty of orphan houses that, that are out there. However, this particular image that I'm showing here is um, Lamont Street in California Kirkbride on the north side. And thanks to Google Street View, this is an image that was captured in 2011. We can see what this hillside and what this street looks like because today that house and the stairs are long gone. In fact, in 2012, both the house and the stairs were demolished. So Google Street View, I'm sure most of you are researchers here and you probably already know about Street View. You know, it doesn't, in Pittsburgh, the earliest Street View capture dates date to 2007, so it's not like you can totally you know, go way back in time. Uh, but it, the, a lot has changed in Pittsburgh from 2007 till today. Um, and it's interesting little bits like this, because there has been so much continual uh, demolition and rebuilding and changing of neighborhoods and streets and everything, that going back and, and looking at Street View footage from um, the earliest days can, can really give you some good insights uh, because this, I, I, like, like I said, this flight of stairs doesn't exist anymore. You can only see it through Google Street View. So another thing um, that, you know, is also uh, an issue with the stairs is that, you know, while everything from City Steps 2.0, you know, was well constructed and, uh, you know, well engineered, well built, the issue is that concrete really has a shelf life of like 50 to 75 years. And because things were built like around 1950, that means like the expiration date has kind of come and gone. Um, but also because of Pittsburgh's depopulation uh, and the demolition of structures along the hillside, this is something that has contributed to hillside erosion. So this is an area here in fine view. This is rising Maine. It's one of the longest flights in the city. It has 333, 331 steps. Um, and it was built in a neighborhood that when it was built, the neighborhood was called the East Street Valley neighborhood. That neighborhood pretty much existed where the highway is right now. And, um, and throughout, between through the 70s to the 1990s, um, there was a, a gradual uh, seizing of eminent domain to construct and expand the roads and, and build the highways that would go out to the northern suburbs. And in time, uh, you know, that neighborhood ceased to exist. But Rising Maine was originally built to bring the people of Fineview uh, down into the East Street Valley neighborhood for work because it was a, a primary commercial and industrial corridor. And while this area now is extremely depopulated, you can see on the bottom photo there, there's a, a couple of uh, houses that the city isn't even going to spend money to demolish them because, you know, there are very, very few people that even live on this street. Um, but it's that uh, the erosion of the hillside has, is, has really like impacted the overall structural integrity of the flight of stairs, which as you see in this photo, I like to 
say it's like it has scoliosis of the spine <laughs> of the stairs. Um, and this is something that, this is a flight of stairs that the city is never going to fix. They're never going to repair it uh, because it would literally be tens of millions of dollars into an area that it, it doesn't go anywhere. It bottoms out at the, at the highway. Um, so I say to people like, oh, it's a piece of history. If you want to see it, you can drive out there. You can still walk up and down it. It's open to people. You got to exercise a little caution. Uh, but this is something that uh, you know. All it is going to take is uh, a really rainy spring uh, to have uh, you know more erosion along the hillside, which will ultimately even weaken uh, you know the structure of the stairs even further. And then at some point, the city will close it off. But I don't want to end this talk on like a negative, bad note, like, oh, everything is sad, everything's falling apart, because there, are, there is good news uh, that's here as well. Uh, and the first is that in the last five years, Pittsburgh has started to come back around to, to caring about the infrastructure. You know, we have to do it in a different way than what was done after World War II, because it's a very different city, and we also, it's very different times. Um, people aren't always necessarily taking the stairs up and down to go work at a mill along the river. Um, you know, our city is a different one now and, and, you know, life is different in many ways. But the city steps are really is an essential way to connect people within their neighborhood and to other neighborhoods and to commercial corridors within those neighborhoods. Um, and so for the last five years, as you know, you know, just from following the news and everything, you know, the city government has, you know, been trying to put aside funding to help fix the city stairs, to come up with a plan for their repair. This also coincides with the installation of bike lanes, uh, working on rebuilding city steps and connecting them with bike lanes is a real, uh, you know, essential way to, you know, kind of get two things done at once. It helps people to, you know, to bike and use alternative forms of transportation um, and also uses the stairs as well to make it easier for people to get through the hillside. Uh, and this is a photo here in the Hill District, uh, Middle Hill, uh, before on the left-hand side from 2017 and then after from 2019. This was one of the first flights um, that was rebuilt as part of uh, all of the, the big rebuilding that started around 16, 17. Here's another flight here. This is on the north side. Uh, this is kind of at the intersection of Spring Garden, Spring Hill, East Deutschtown. Um, and this is a, another flight of stairs that this one had been closed uh, because it, the concrete had just given way. However, the city realized that people were continuing to use the stairs, even though it was closed, because there were several bus routes and bus stops uh, that people needed to access down at the bottom of the stairs. And so, you know, kind of like a throwback to the days gone by of like, yeah, there are people that still need to use them to access transportation to get to work. And so this was another flight that uh, received kind of priority uh, rebuild. Uh, it did take a little bit longer to get repaired because, you know, COVID kind of hit in the middle of it. Uh, so it extended the, the, um, the construction time by about a year. But in September of 21, it reopened. And this flight is really beautiful. If you're ever around on the north side, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, it's built in a completely different way from the old uh, 2.0, the, the, the 3.0s, as I like to call what we're doing today, uh, have a, a number of different things. Uh, the first is that you can see from the railings, there's a um, mesh uh, throughout all of it. So there's like an extra layer of safety, and which is so important if you're walking with children or you're walking with dogs. Uh, this flight also has a bike runnel that's attached to it. That's the, that's the yellow uh, line that you see running up alongside the stairs for a person to just drop the wheels of their bike in. This is a flight that also has solar-powered LED lights for extra safety, which is really important because in the wintertime it gets dark by 5 or 5.30. And uh, most importantly for today's bodies, the step profile is considerably less. So while that means it's more steps, which is probably good if you've got a Fitbit, right? Um, more steps to get up to the top, 
they are not as steep. So it just makes it a little bit easier on today's body. And there's a beautiful mosaic mural by local artist Linda Wallen. That mosaic mural had been installed on the original flight. Uh, it had been installed in the, the early 2000s. And the city was able to preserve the mosaic and uh, make sure it could be incorporated into the new design. We also, let's not forget the sidewalk stairs. Uh, there are also new construction techniques for these as well. This is uh, in Greenfield, not too far from here. Uh, this is another flight along a very steep hillside uh, that you can see here. It looks a little bit different from that other photo that we saw, saw of Mount Washington. Another thing that, uh, that the city and public works does now is that there's more attention on uh, stormwater management. And if you look off to the side of the photos that are there, you see all that crushed uh, large stone that is to help with water runoff. Um, so that's a, another technique uh, that is used now. And this sidewalk flight does have a bike runnel. It's built into the concrete uh, right along the side. It's like a, it's a small track that you can, once again, put, put the tires in and walk your bike up or down the flight of stairs, which might be easier than trying to just bike up that steep grade. And then finally, here's a, I, I love showing these because boy oh boy, this is a hot mess all over the place here. This is Carrick in the South Hills. This is Copperfield Avenue. It's one of the steepest streets in the city. It has a grade of 23%. Um, and this is, uh, this is a flight of stairs, this actually, it's not a flight of stairs, it's seven flights of stairs um, that travel up this long section of Copperfield Ave. It has multiple intersections, and this area was just a mess. Uh, this <laughs> brick trough, sluiceway, that is in the middle here was, uh, um, you know, back from maybe the 40s or the 50s, that was designed to help with water runoff. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, it was implemented and people had the best of intentions, and it probably worked for a while back when they first did it. But of course, over time, as you can see from the photos now, after several decades, it's, uh, you know, it's clogged with weeds and dirt and litter. Uh, repaving projects have you know, caused all kinds of asphalt to fall into it. Uh, it's just like, oh, it was just, it was just awful. And, uh, and so this was a whole area that Public Works uh, worked on with a, a subcontractor to rebuild this entire street, all seven flights in this area. This, these are the befores of what segments looked like. And while this is not complete, this is photos from um, October of, of late last year. And while the railings had not been installed yet, those were installed this spring, this is now what the area looks like. So for all of those many, many people who had houses that line, <laughs> line the street, um, it's like happy days for all of those folks because now they just have much easier access um, it, uh, the safety has just been greatly improved because that brick trough has just been removed from the equation. And as a result of that, the street is actually a little bit wider now, uh, which is also helpful because, you know, the modern world that we live in, people get deliveries and things like that. And this just makes it so much easier uh, for vehicles to access all of the homes that, that line this very uh, populated street in Carrick. So, Public Works is out there getting the work done every day. And so, I know this probably went way over, and I'm, I'm so sorry if I didn't do it. I hope you enjoyed. There's more photos that I've taken here. I know, what time are we at here? <laughs> we're, we're fine. Uh, how, we're okay. Fine. Uh, do people okay. have, I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions, or if we have to move on you know, with your schedule, I can stick around and I can talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, whatever, you, you, that's fine. whatever you'd like to, whatever you'd like to do. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we got Q&A. Okay. Super. So your book will not be out until next year. Sometime, hopefully, we're hoping for sometime so next year. So we have to wait. 
Oh, so, that time. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I can help you find places. If you, if you want to go for walks and find places, you just connect with me. Or like, you know, you can, you can find me on my website or connect me. I can give you my email address. And I have, I have walks to share and all kinds of things. I'm, I'm happy. I just love having people go out and walk around neighborhoods. Like, that's my favorite thing. Because um, I often say to people, walking is one of the most subversive things that you can do today, which is like kind of in some ways like a little sad that walking has become subversive. <laughs> but, uh, but I really feel that going out and exploring neighborhoods and just being out there, especially like if you're with a group of friends and you know, you're going and seeing things, it helps to rebuild the connection you know, with humanity and walking allows you to see so many more things that you don't see when you're driving by in a car. Now I'm not an anti-car person, I have a car. Um, I got here using my car, but I also feel that, you know, walking around, you see so much, you meet people, and especially here in Pittsburgh, people are so friendly. Uh, you know, I talk about over the last five or six years of walking all over the neighborhoods, all the neighborhoods, um, and photographing the stairs, and I never once had a bad experience, never. And in fact, you know, people would ask, sometimes people were a little nervous, like they thought maybe I was like a city inspector or I was a real estate developer. Um, but once I assured them, like, oh no, 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 I'm like, I'm a historian and I'm, I'm just taking photographs and I want to learn about the stairs. People were so friendly and they'd come down and they'd talk and they'd talk about, you know, how long they lived in the neighborhood and if they were a long time resident. You know, they would talk about their experiences. I had people when there were stairs I couldn't locate. If there was someone out and about, I knew I could ask them. And chances are they would help me. Oh yeah, you've got to come this way. Yeah, it's all overgrown. Just ignore that. It's really over here. And, and uh, you know, and this for me was such a, a life-affirming, positive experience. And, um, and so that's why I like to say it's like, oh, you know, Go, go out, take some walks. It's like, it, it's really, it's, it's, such a, it's such a wonderful thing to do. So more, more questions, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that the, I only know of one set of stairs in Squirrel Hill, and that's on yes. my back. so are there any more? Squirrel Hill only has a few. Um, there is the one that's on Lilac. Um, there is another one that leads down to the Homestead Grays Bridge uh, from that far part of, of Squirrel Hill. Um, and then there are a couple real short flights, but Squirrel Hill is a neighborhood that really does not have very many. There's, uh, there's a couple close to CMU, but really the, mo the largest flights, uh, the most commanding in terms of the architecture and build, are really in the steepest, the hilliest neighborhoods. Now, Squirrel Hill does have, because of its connection to Shenley Park, there are lots of city steps in the park. Uh, and the city does have um, uh, responsibility for those now as well. The stairs that were built in the park were, for the most part, they were built during the Great Depression with WPA funding. Um, at, at different times. But those stairs uh, in Shenley Park are gorgeous because they're made out of the, I, I say that it looks like something out of Harry Potter. You know, it's like they've got like the grand stone and, and cut and everything and it's, it's really beautiful in, in the setting. But, but those are there as, as well. You know, we forget like the, all the parks have, have stairs in them also. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, how certain are you if you have documented all the stairs. <laughs> oh, oh, well, you know, I now follow, so one of the things that's happened in the last, like, five, six, seven years is that the city now keeps track of everything. So what happened when uh, Peduto was elected mayor and, you know, he had his whole, like, green initiatives and everything that he was trying to do. He acquired Bob Rubin's data. And that data first went to Public Works because Public Works needed to have a computerized database of where all the stairs were because that didn't exist before. Um, and so that was created. And then from there, the city continued to build out its technology 
And now the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, which is also a relatively new city department, it works with public works, um, it does a lot of architecture for infrastructure and planning, they house where all of the city steps locations and data. So it is something that is widely available to the public now. So people don't have to, you know, like Bob, ride around on their bike, <laughs> you know, looking for things. Or like I did, I had to buy Bob's book and get Bob's personal well, data. Did you find steps that were in Bob's book? Yes, there were yes, there were some steps that I found that were in Bob's book and there have also been steps that have been built since Bob wrote his book. So, and, but the city has that comprehensive list now. So for those uh, people like myself who are kind of OCD and really like to have like the up-to-date list, you know, you can always download it in an Excel spreadsheet format and then kind of keep track of where you visited and what things are. But it's important to know that the city, it's a live, uh, it's, it's live data. So when work is done or something new is built, they are always refreshing and adding to it, which just adds to the intrigue. Yes. <laughs> ever be a possibility that this could turn to a major tourist attraction for the state? I, I mean, if you could bring people in, exactly. Yeah. that would be incredible. I know. It that would doesn't be. exist any place else. I know. Well, there are other cities that have a lot of city steps, but Pittsburgh is number one by far. So Los Angeles has a lot of public stairways, Seattle, San Francisco. Those are like the big three West Coast cities that are so very different from Pittsburgh. Um, and then closer to home, there's Cincinnati. Cincinnati has about 450 flights of stairs because uh, the topography there is, is somewhat similar. Um, but Pittsburgh has the most by far because we have the most unruly terrain of all of those locations. And, uh, you know, it is something that uh, for urban hiking enthusiasts, there are groups out there that, you know, people like to go out and explore urban areas and, and hike stairs and, and all of that. Those types of groups do exist. And, you know, it would be great if the city, uh, you know, got behind it more. But I also acknowledge that, you know, once again, infrastructure for 700,000 and we have 300,000 now. And we have a different kind of economic tax base now than what we had in the 1940s and 1950s. So it's like, okay, you can only, it's like a budget, right? You can only spend so much on certain things. But it would be great to have people like, you know, get involved and, and publicize and then also advocate for their repair. Um, that's how the city really manages it now. It's like, it's about communities getting involved and saying, hey, this, there, there are stairs in this neighborhood. Uh, we care about this. We use it. We use it to access transportation. We need it to, you know, get to the grocery store. Um, you know, we need it for exercise and, you know, badgering your city council person, uh, working with community groups, uh, 311, when repairs need to be made. Uh, you know, so much of it is about, you know, people having to advocate for it now because I have a lot of friends that work in public works and they work. They work every day. Um, but there's so much work to be done. And public works is not going around looking for problems to solve. They <laughs> look for, okay, what's been reported to 311? Who, like, council persons on the phone, oh, you've got to get this fixed, you know. That's how priorities are established. So if you see something in a neighborhood where you like to walk or where you, you know, travel or, or whatever, 311 it and then you know just do the thing of just like reaching out reaching out to council people is really how it gets done and letting and letting other people know because the more messages they get and the more requests they get that's when things happen you know so uh, yes yeah oh it's Sorry, uh, have you done any research on the uh, the engineering firms and the contractors that built these stairways um, well, so there's some of that in the history. So people have often thought that public works built everything um, and that they still build everything today. And while public works is certainly involved and they do some things, um, even historically, they were not the only ones. There was always so much work to be done that work was always subcontracted out. And that process 
um, in some ways it hasn't really changed over time. So, you know, even historically there would be, uh, you know, ordinances and things like that with uh, notices being posted that, you know, the city was looking for, you know, qualified bids and whatnot to, you know, build this flight of stairs or take on this set of work and whatnot. And uh, so that's always been a, a process that the city has. You know, today, Public Works does go out and they make some repairs um, and they do some things, but like the Copperfield Ave, the, uh, the place in the South Hills that had the brick sluiceway in it, that was, that was a project that was completely subcontracted. Uh, the head of construction for Public Works, you know, he oversaw, uh, you know, the project, but, you know, they had their subcontractor, they fix lots and lots of stairs around the city, they know what they're doing, and they just go off and they do the work. Yes, in the back. Do you identify which steps have been um, in movies since Pittsburgh? Oh, um, no. no. That's a great question to research. Go ahead. That sounds like a project. <laughs> I always say it's like this is a field that's wide open. I am not the only one here. Like, get involved. You know? No, I don't. Know. The only thing that I do know is that, and this isn't a flight of stairs, but the opening scene in Flashdance, when Jennifer Beale's character is on her bike, she is biking down uh, what was called Nunnery Hill, but it's part of Fine View. And she goes around this corner, Henderson Street, and there are all kinds of city stairs around that, but she's on a bike. So they're not really focusing on the stairs, and you know, it's about flash dance in the movie and whatever. Uh, but that is something that that was an area where there are city stairs um, that was in a very popular movie. But I don't know about other ones. That's a good question. Dominic and Eugene did a trash collecting with all the south side slopes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great movie. <laughs> Anything else? Anything? Oh, yes. Sir. There's so many that are closed. I mean, you can't. Yes. Yeah, they totally blocked off. Yes. That's a, that's a huge percentage. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, well, it's a combination. Public works, and this is a. Uh, um, Public works is required. Once they have determined that a flight is unsafe to people, they have to come and block it off, right? They're not blocking it off to like be jerks or anything like that. It's like it's their responsibility and also their licensing um, and everything. It, you know, they have to go out and they have to do the right thing. Um, however, what what happens is that because there's always the delay between something being closed and something being fixed. And that lag can be because of lack of advocacy or whatnot. There are people that will continue to use the stairs even though they've been closed because they have to. Um, however, you know, I feel that there are, I don't know what the count is of stairs that are closed right now. I can think of a couple big ones that are closed off the top of my head. Um, but a lot of times stairs don't, they're not even closed because no one has ever even called in to say, oh, there's a problem here, right? So there, we have stairs in neighborhoods, like this is particularly the case and throughout Homewood in the East Hills, where those neighborhoods are so extremely depopulated, right? You can go out and see, it's something like, it's like post-apocalyptic, like you feel like you're on a movie set or something, right? You're out on a street that is now like, you know, you can barely even see the asphalt underneath it, and you'll see this gigantic flight of stairs, and there's not a house anywhere around. Like you feel like you're out in the middle of the country. And, but it's knowing that, well, you know, a hundred years ago, there was actually a whole big neighborhood here because the city never would have built this giant flight of steps if there weren't a whole bunch of people living in this area to support it. So there are ruins of stairs all over the city and those aren't closed because, you know, there's, there's nobody there to, to complain about their condition because there's nobody that lives there anymore. And that's not just the case in Homewood and East Hills. There are places up on the north side, uh, California Kirkbride, uh, parts of uh, uh, Marshall Shadeland, uh, some other areas in and around there where that's the case.
Yes, sir. Okay. Last there, there are a few short runs of steps in our part of South Squirrel Hill yes. uh, in the Cate and Landview area. I'm convinced that some of the neighborhood residents have really just put some boards across. Well, that, that happens too, right? And there's a couple reasons for that. And that's not too unique to Pittsburgh. Actually, Los Angeles has a, a problem with that as well. Though Los Angeles is a very different city from Pittsburgh. Uh, but oftentimes, people, particularly in uh, more residential neighborhoods, uh, don't want that like public access any longer. And of course it was different when the stairs were built, say like you know in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, right? There was pro there was probably a lot more walking. All oh, the kids going back and forth to school and you know going to work and shopping and whatever. It was a regular occurrence and the fabric of the neighborhoods was very different. Now you fast forward all these decades and things are very different. And people in more recent years start to associate using the stairs with crime or vice. Why are they using the stairs? Are they up to like something bad? You know, whatever. Um, you know, there's all of that. And so in more residential neighborhoods, that is something that people, you know, it's kind of in some ways they say like, well, no one really uses these anymore and it's right on my property line. I'm just going to you know, I'm just going to kind of close it off, or I'm going to dump a bunch of stuff here. This is where I'm going to, you know, dump my leaf litter and cut branches and, and whatever. I have seen that in several different neighborhoods all over the city. I've seen that in Squirrel Hill, but uh, I've seen it in Lincoln Place. I've seen it in parts of the Hill District, the Middle Hill. Um, I've seen it up on the north side. So it is something where it's, you know, it's some of the owners uh, around it, and it's, you know, they have their reasons. Maybe they're, they've had solid reasons for wanting to limit access. Maybe there have been things that have happened in the past, and, you know, they feel like, oh, they haven't been properly addressed, you know, law enforcement and, and things like that. And so sometimes people take matters into their own hands. So it's, everyone's a different story. Uh, who is responsible for, say, cutting back the vegetation, picking up the litter to keep them passable? Yeah, I, this is, I, I'm always, I always get this question, and the answer I have to give is always a very unpopular one. You can certainly 311 it, but you have to know that public works will maybe be able to come out and do that once a year. Maybe. And maybe that's cutting it back. With the litter, you can connect with Allegheny Cleanways, which is an awesome nonprofit group that's been doing a lot of great work here in Pittsburgh. Um, but you know, there's litter all over the place. So my answer to people is always like, we have to take care of it. If there's stairs that are near our house that we use, you know, maybe it's near where we like to exercise or walk the dog. Take your choppers with you. Take a little bag, you know, your little gloves. Pick it up. Um, you know, I mean, that's what I do in my neighborhood. And, um, I, and I know it's often not the answer that people want. They would much easier, nicer to just call someone and have it taken care of. But, um, but that's not the kind of world that we live in anymore. Those resources are just not there. They're just not there. So anyway. I'm getting the built. Every single one is different. Um, I personally love, I always say like, go see Rising Main up in Fineview just because it's, you know, it's one of the longest ones that you can still travel along. Uh, I think one of the longest ones that's also uh, very pretty, which is out in the South Hills, is Jacob Street in Brookline Over, oh, Overbrook slash Brookline. It's near uh, a Brookline uh, public park that's there. Uh, that one is a really pretty area because there's also lots of like walking trails and everything through it. And then, um, you know, go and walk around the South Side Slopes. You know, the 68 flights. And with the South Side Slopes Business Association, all of the old Step Trek walks are available. You can download them on from their website. So you can get many, many years worth of, of walks to do uh, around the side, south, south Side Slopes. And I also offer walking tours on the North Side of um, uh, Troy Hill, Spring Garden, and Spring Hill City View. 
I offer them once a month through Threadbare Cider and Mead, which is in Spring Garden. Uh, those are Saturday morning walks once a month. And I also offer Sunday morning walks through Walk the Burg Tours, uh, which is based downtown. And that's a walk that starts in the Strip District, and we walk through the Heinz Loft, and then go up to Troy Hill, and, and everything. But uh, if you have, you know, if you want information about great places to walk, I do have some walks that I've written down. I have lots of resources on my website. And, uh, you know, hopefully in a year or so, there'll be a book that comes out. But until then, you know, when the weather's good, like, get out there and walk around. <laughs> you know, that's, that's my, that's my uh, if you learned anything or took any sort of inspiration away from this talk, I hope, I hope it's that you do that. So. Anyway, thank you so much for having me.